Hello and welcome to The Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong. I'm Alex. I'm Julio, and thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe and leave us a five-star review. Help promote the algorithm and spread the word. You can also find us on SoundCloud to subscribe and review. And don't forget to visit our main website, wearethecontrarians.com. Follow us on Twitter at Contrarian Prime. And to like us on Facebook, visit facebook.com slash Contrarian Prime. And if you have the willpower to keep up with our pretentious ramblings, you can follow us individually at Contrarian Alex for myself and at Avnio for Julio. That's O-V-N-I-O. Now, time for the podcast. Right. I am recording for Contrarian's Corner for Lost Souls. Excellent. Hello, and welcome back to the Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong. My name is Alex, joined as always by my Peruvian counterpart, Julio. Uh, back on the numeric trail, the sequential episode, or the numeric episode, I should say. Is that correct? That is correct. We are uh, month number two of the summer of Winona. And that would be episode 109. 109. Yes. Yes. As we fittingly come to you on a stormy, uh, what day is it? Time is evading me uh, these days. Wednesday. 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 Yes. Uh, it is thundering and lightning. I think it, they knew what kind of movie we were going to be talking about this evening. <laughs> very, very frightening. And then also um, fitting in with the, the motif, the theme, the backdrop of this movie about Satan coming back to Earth. A very important aspect of the movie is the 33rd birthday, which we are now two days away from mine. And that watching oh that. Oh, my God. Yeah. That, that was like, uh, this lined up very quizzically. So I, are you going to sure. start that? Uh, are you going to be looking for pentagrams in, yes. your, uh, <laughs> in your house? My ceiling that's not really a ceiling. And I just hit it with a broom and it falls down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so that definitely had me worried of what may be to come on Friday. But uh, if you are not picking up our context clues, we are here to discuss the 2000 film Lost Souls. My understanding, one of those movies that had been done for a year or two before it actually got released. But what was that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that came out in late 99 about Satan coming to Earth? End of Days. End, end of Days. Watch mm. it in theaters. God bless. Uh, I just remember him <laughs> being on SmackDown to promote it, and he bitch slapped Triple H. That's the main thing I remember. Uh, but that was 99, right? Yes. Uh, the it, it was 99. You know how I remember? Because a big twist of the movie, and this is not a spoiler, really. It's like a stupid, stupid uh, plot development. But uh, the year is 1999, mm -hmm. and I think it's Rod Steiger. He's like the priest or somebody, one of the main characters. And he tells Schwarzenegger, it's 1999, 999. Upside down is 666. Ooh. Oh, my God. <laughs> my God. So, um, Julio, you, you nailed the pronunciation of Mr. Kaminsky's first name a bit better than I, the director of this movie. Janice Kaminsky. Janice, okay. Uh, Two-time Academy Award winner for his cinematographical work on, uh, I believe it was um, Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan. So him and Spielberg. Oh, and he also did War Horse and Lincoln. So him and Spielberg were like, you know, peanut butter and jelly. Lamb and tuna fish, <laughs> as they say. A wink and a smile. A wink and a smile. And of course, starring this, front and center on the poster, top billing, Winona Ryder. Did you do enough research to see who this was produced by? Is it Meg Ryan? It is Meg Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I... You know, it was one of those bits of information that I I thought, okay, I need to look back and, and make sure that I got that right. Uh, but then, you know, I didn't because I was so <laughs> so shaken by everything else. She uh, believed yeah, Meg Ryan. So, so thoroughly and so sternly in this project. So um, getting into it, if this is your first time listening to The Contrarians, as uh, we do appreciate your listen. If you're a returning listener, we appreciate you all as well. Please uh, give us a moment here. Uh, while we indulge our new listeners in explaining our gimmick, uh, we like to rage against the Rotten Tomatoes machine, as we say. We find a movie on Rotten Tomatoes that is highly rated, uh, oftentimes referred to as certified fresh. 
and make a case for maybe why it shouldn't be. On the inverse of that, we find a movie that is low rated, usually 30% and low, known as Rotten, and make a case for, you know, maybe what's not so bad about it. Being that Lost Souls is a meager 8% on Rotten Tomatoes, we will be uh, explaining maybe why the critics got this one wrong. Yeah, 8%. Uh, I want to say that's our lowest for the summer of Winona. Uh, th- this is, as far as Rotten Tomatoes goes, this is the low point. Uh, as far as reality goes, that's that remains to be seen. And if you want to know how we really feel about this movie, this thriller, this religious paradigm, uh, <laughs> hang around for the second portion of the podcast, the appropriately titled Real Talk. Now, typically Julio would kick us off with some quotes from uh, a few different um, film critics from Rotten Tomatoes is typically where he goes, uh, sometimes Letterbox. But for the summer of Winona, if you've been keeping up, we're uh, having multiple uh, contributors record their piece on uh, certain movies with no known writer and send it on in. And if my understanding is correct, we have a um, multiple time guest of the contrarians and uh, day one listener providing his uh, opinions on lost souls. That is correct. Brad and Curtis came to the rescue because we didn't have a single person <laughs> volunteer to do a clip for Lost Souls. But of course, Brad and Curtis, he's here to tell us what he felt about it. So here we go. I'm not sure what would have compelled anybody to take on a project like this. It doesn't have anything interesting to say about faith, the evil that men do to one another, or even the very concept of evil itself with a capital E. It also doesn't have anything to say about the mindset of Winona Ryder's character, who tags along on exorcisms and may have even been possessed at one point herself. It just offers no insight into her character or her past. It just sort of meanders along with nothing to offer anyone for any reason, kind of like its own title. It's just sort of a drift, a lost soul. Brandon Curtis, ladies and gentlemen, triumphant return. It's been a while. I was about to Uh, say, uh, Longfellow couldn't have said it better. Yeah. uh, I don't know, Alex, this is your first time watching it. It was my first time watching it. uh, Were were you shaken by it? It was, uh, it reminded me a lot of that Gary Oldman movie by um, David Goyer from the mid 2000s. Mm. I'm trying to remember that exorcism movie. Uh, it, Unborn? The Unborn? No, maybe. I don't know. But I remember it. It also had James <laughs> Remar in it. And it gave me a lot of uh, the same vibes here. of Just a lot of flashing lights and chaos and very uh, tense emotion from the, for the duration of it. Of course, that movie only had Gary Oldman. It didn't have uh, Winona Ryder, who stars in this movie. And as we do from time to time on The Contrarians, we... Uh, dip our finger into the Wikipedia honeypot to (laughs) help out with sometimes plot summations and just generally comical wording for the way some of these people write these uh, entries. So uh, to kick us off for Lost Souls, I wanted to read the plot synopsis on Wikipedia. A small group of fervent Roman Catholics believe Satan intends to become a man just as God did in the person of Jesus. Writings from a seemingly possessed Psychiatric patient lead them to Peter Kesslin. The group suspects it is Kesslin's body Satan has chose to occupy. The youngest of the group, Maya Larkin, meets Peter to investigate further and try to convince him of embodied evil. Other signs come to Kesslin as he and Maya take a journey full of strange occurrences, self-discovery, and an ultimate showdown. That is the entire plot synopsis. (laughs) That is arguably the entire movie. Uh, it's minus true. the flavor. <laughs> and that's like the for your consideration verbiage, too, at the end. <laughs> Strange occurrences, self-discovery, and an ultimate showdown. So the titular character, Lost Souls, Winona Ryder. <laughs> um, she we was kick lost off, and then she was found. <laughs> we kick off with the New Line uh, Cinema signature, which always fills me with intense nostalgia, which I'm not sure they were... I think still a functioning studio till about 2004, but you know what I'm talking about? The signature. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. So, so, so the sound sounds familiar, but I'm trying to figure out what the, what the logo itself is. It's like, I'm thinking the DreamWorks. No, it's a splice of film that kind of comes together. And like one of the sound bars is crooked and it says new line cinema at the bottom. 
You'd know it if you saw it. Uh, uh, of course I would, yeah. I just, you know, the, your ability to to just match the logos and the themes with the movies under that line always amazes me because that's something that I, I it's not in my bag of tricks. Uh, we get some sexy black and white uh, reflective credits, which kind of threw me for a loop. What do you think about these? They were like backwards, but not really. It, it was I, uh, uh, it was engaging from the jump, just trying to figure out what they were going for. Made me think of Seven. Uh, I don't remember if it's the the opening credits of Seven or the closing credits of Seven that are just like kind of weird. Uh, for one, they go backwards. <laughs> I think they go because you know credits normally go from the bottom to the top, but I think the Seven credits go from the bottom from the top to the bottom. Just kind of like fucking with your mind. Same thing here. Uh, from the very beginning, it's like trust no one. It's true, and it's sepia toned, and also, uh, I mean, now's as good a time as any to talk about it because it's the kickoff for the movie, a movie that was. Um, Finished, filmed in 98, 99, uh, a few good years before the first uh, The Born Identity was released. And this, you know, this brought The Born Cam to the major motion picture uh, <laughs> industry. I mean, we, yeah. we don't get one steady shot the entire movie. We get those extreme close ups of faces. I mean, uh, it gets it's called The Born Cam for a reason. But I think we we wrongly attribute it. That's the power that critics irresponsibly wield. Like, you slap an 8% on a movie like this one, and then suddenly every single good thing that managed to be transcendent about it, it's it's forgotten or or attributed to someone else. I mean, the director is a, is a DP, and that already, that always, at the very least, assures you that the visuals are going to be memorable. Uh, you know, we've seen it before, uh, DPs making the jump to directing, it's usually pretty rewarding, right? Uh, I want to say Barry Sonnenfeld used to be a DP. Uh, John DeBond, you know, the guy behind mm-hmm. Speed. So, yeah, you might say it's uh, Kaminsky's first movie, but it's not really his first movie. You know, he's he's been around. He's been around Spielberg. He's been around other directors. and he So he comes at it with a very distinctive visual style from the beginning as a DP would. So I would say I understand that maybe the subject matter can be a little touchy. A little sensitive mm. for some people because you're talking about religion and and just some very hardcore beliefs. But I can't imagine there's a single person that would watch this and say that at the very least it doesn't look awesome. It's it looks great. And not just because it's full of attractive people from Winona Ryder to Ben Chaplin to John Hurt. It's just the way it's shot, it's great. A lot of uh new line horror movies specialize in wetness and at least the first act of this movie, everything is kind of wet. So I was definitely, you know, having not seen this movie before, but being familiar with New Line's brand of horror movies, I, I was very comfortable right away. They, they, You felt at home. I think that's the point. They only kept everything wet for the first act just to ease in us longtime viewers, but maybe new to the um, supernatural, the uh, religiously supernatural genre. Uh, you know, we think the star power resides in Winona Ryder, but then, of course... Casey Jones himself, Elias Cotez, appears <laughs> clean shaven. So that kind of threw me off. Not even the five o'clock shadow. Good head of hair, too. Oh, I don't yeah. know if it was, it was actual hair or if it was a toupee. See, um, this, there was something supernatural about it. This, this is a believable version of what Casey Jones would have looked like when he grew up. Like he is uh, the ninth hour of boyhood version of. Um, <laughs> Why am I blanking on his name now? <laughs> Ethan Hawk. Ethan Hawk, thank you. Where he's got the mustache and the minivan and the kids. This is Casey Jones grown up. You know, he's still got a little length to his hair, but combs it back, clean shaven. Still still a loose cannon. Has since found God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is, uh, you know, this little group of exorcists. I don't know if it's because I've been listening to people talk about it recently. Uh, it, uh, just Ghostbusters must have had some sort of anniversary. But they're basically Ghostbusters, but for real. You know, it's, this is not about... Slimers or or Marshmallow Mans. This is just about actual demons. So you have John Hurt, who, I, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong. I, this is how I assign the roles. John Hurt would be Peter Vangman, right? He would be Bill Murray, because arguably he's the most, like, kind of like the leader, I guess, mm-hmm. the face of the group. Then you have Elias Cotias. Casey Jones would be Dan Aykroyd. He would be Ray. Okay. He, he's like the second in command. Winona would be Winston. Because she's kind of the outsider. She comes, you know, they're all priests except for her. She has, she's just a civilian. And then, and then the fourth person, like this guy that doesn't really get a name or anything, he'll be Egon because he's just the Harold Ramis kind of left behind in the background. And then I guess whenever, whenever Ben Chaplin comes in, he would be Sigourney Weaver. <laughs> and um, would uh, Philip Baker Hall be 
uh, Rick Moranis? <laughs> Uh, I mean, at this point, he has to be. We just run out of main characters. <laughs> I was about to say, that's what I was scraping the bottom of the barrel. I was like, well, who's left in this movie? <laughs> Did you recognize uh, Ben Chaplin's brother? Yes. Uh, he's in my notes, so let's just save it until we get there. How about that? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> we meet Henry, who is um, an inmate who is, I believe is on death row for murder but these religious folk believe that he could be empowered by the spirit of satan we get kind of these um lined up interweaving clips and we also find out that winona was exercised at one point and that's how she i guess found god or came to the church because uh, and that's also i think why she understands it on a a different level than everyone because she's actually lived through it but uh quickly establishing a little bit of backstory and i do appreciate that yeah that's like a quick flashback it's like a quick flashback tells you pretty much a whole movie worth of uh, backstory for Winona Ryder. It's girl interrupted Winona, though. Did you catch that? Because she's got her short haircut. Yes. You know, and, and uh, I think I was looking through her filmography. I think girl it's actually just B-roll was... from uh, Girl Interrupted. <laughs> it's, uh, it's from uh, from when she uh, found out that uh, Angelina Jolie had been nominated, but not her. Not her, Yes. <laughs> We're introduced to the second billing in this movie, Ben Chaplin, who plays Peter Kesslin, who is an author and uh, I wouldn't say a scientist. How would you describe him? Uh, I, I mean, to me, he sounded a bit like an, an opportunist. I don't know that there was much science behind what he was saying. He's just one of those guys that uh, likes to be on the sidelines and point out where everybody went wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, I mean, he's a, uh, mainly, I think, he's a, he's a true crime author. And this is the first time I've seen one up close. <laughs> on the screen at least i mean i think he he represents them well he's uh he's so uh he's so attractive that uh skylar from breaking bad can't uh stop flirting with him while she's interviewing him yeah so, on whatever city they're in's version of you know the morning show uh i have in my notes here is this the summer of winona or summer of breaking bad because we had tuco <laughs> and alien resurrection <laughs> skylar in this i mean I think it's just it's common logic at this point that Brian Cranston shows up later in this. I mean, you could argue that they got the next best thing to play the the guy that's uh, on death row because he he kind of looks like Cranston towards the end of the show when he's just all bearded and beaten down. Just a defeated man. Yeah, fueled by Satan though. <laughs> so Winona sees this. Uh, Maya becomes aware of this Kesslin figure. Uh, because he, uh, the re- what ties them together is this Henry, this convict that was presumably uh, inherited with the spirit of Satan. He, uh, Kesslin, that is, is very dismissive of this claim and that, you know, he doesn't believe there's anything like a true evil. Um, he just kind of, and he does come across very uh, cocky, but also charming and cunning in this scene, but basically dismisses the whole idea of it. And I think Winona sees some evil in this if i interpreted this correctly well she she cracks the code which i thought was great because i i don't know i don't know if we've ever talked about our religious upbringings or lack so thereof she, I, she uses her codex to figure this out <laughs> yeah but you know i grew up catholic i'm I'm no longer i mean i'm not a i'm not even like you know say non-practicing catholic i'm just like a non anything but i did grow up catholic and at least growing up Catholic, you are instilled with this, uh, I don't know, this sense, this idea that uh, that Satan, the devil, it's just kind of, you know, he's not just evil, but he's almost as close to omnipotent as, as it could get. You know, it's like, you can't lower your guard. It's like fully powerful evil. And, and this movie kind of goes with that too, but they also managed to, I wouldn't say humanize him, but at least kind of give him something beyond it being evil. In this case, is the fact that he can't help himself and he leaves clues. He's like the Riddler. He leaves clues for uh, these people to decipher. So using uh, the, this killer as a as a conduit, she he left some sort of a code with with numbers, and we know that cracks it. And it's basically a spelling of uh, of Ben Chaplin's name, and that's basically Satan saying, "Hey, by the way, pay attention to this guy because he's gonna be the Antichrist." That's right. And then, uh, of course. Um the deleted scene, she cracks further more of the code that says, don't forget to drink your Ovaltine. <laughs> Such is my understanding. You know, I never had one of those. I I had a, I remember having a, a book that was sort of like how to be a spy or something. 
and uh-huh. it had like three or four different ways that you could encode a, a message. And uh, I think all four of those were more complicated than the code that Winona breaks in here. Because it's just basically assigning assigning numbers to the letters and letters. To I numbers. think that's why it flew by me, and I, I misinterpreted how she pinned it on Kesslin because it was just so matter of fact. She just looked at all this gibberish and was like, "Ah, yes, Peter Kesslin." Yeah, you're like, is she cracking a code or is she just doing Sudoku? It's just it's just two shots of her doing. You <laughs> it's know what her the problem doing is? A crossword. <laughs> yeah, the problem is that Winona Ryder is just too smart. She looks too smart. Uh, so we, even when when a movie tries to make it look like she's having some sort of mental breakthrough to us it just it just looks so casual because she's just so casual about it uh we as a viewer my next note here i was going to say we the audience but just as a viewer uh great appreciation here for kaminsky because i was just watching most of this movie thinking my god they must have saved a fortune not using any lighting rigs or any lighting of any professional <laughs> sort. And, you know, some people may see that as a, a bad thing. Whereas with me, one, it's smart because it helps keep your your budget, you know, under keeps you in the in the black uh, or in the red. I've never understood how that expression works. And then uh, also it creates a very ominous mood for your film. Yeah, it's appropriate. I mean, you can't that kind of approach doesn't work for every movie. But in this movie, 100 percent. It's a movie about demons, about possession, good and evil. Even going further with that, black and white, right? This is just basically about people that have faith and people that are faithless. Camp One has Winona Ryder as its main, uh, I guess, supporter. She's she's somebody that's in this because she's she has faith. She believes in the teachings of of God and her superiors, and she that's that's what guides her actions. And then on the other hand, you have Ben Chaplin who actively at one point says, I have no faith. It's The only thing missing was him falling to his knees and just screaming, I have no faith. <laughs> have no uh, faith. So that's that, that's what makes their interaction fascinating. And, and it's a very black and white approach, right? It's not that you can't have a little bit of faith. You either have faith or you don't have faith. Therefore, you can't just have, you can't have a little bit of light. You either have lights or you don't. Okay, so we've talked enough about Winona, Maya, and her backstory, and I, I understand just as much as we introduced him into the podcast, as much like the movie with Peter, he's kind of, it's a crash cut into him, and we just kind of meet his character very abruptly, but we do, the movie does take a, a little detour to give us a little bit of backstory on him, and we do get to meet his family, uh, his uncle, played by Philip Baker Hall, Father James, uh, I didn't catch who his fiance or wife was played by, uh, it looked like a, a very young, lovely blonde of the 90s. Uh, but more <laughs> more importantly, <laughs> William Kesslin, uh, Kesslin uh, played by W. Earl Brown, who is, for me, you had already mentioned him. For me, he's Kenny from Scream. He's the cameraman for Courtney Cox. What what do you know uh, Mr. Brown from? Okay, so tiny bit of, I mean, it's real talk because it's real, but but it's, uh, I've actually met him. Because he, oh. he, he's he been to the Austin Film Festival a few times. And like a complete asshole, I didn't know who he was. Even though I had seen him in uh, There's Something About Mary. Where he plays the brother that's always looking for his baseball. And that's right. That is him we too, were. Yeah. Yeah, we were in line, and you know it, it, the way that the it's it is at, at the conference. It's just you're always talking to whoever is around you. So, so I asked him like like he was just somebody like a normal guy. I was like, hey, so so what do you do? And he's like, I'm an actor. And I was like, oh, wh- where have you been in? And you know his resume. He's this guy is is one of those actors that's liking everything, right? I know that I've never seen Deadwood, but I know he's a big character in Deadwood, or at least people a lot of people know him from Deadwood, and you know. You know him from Scream. Uh, and so he starts telling me, and I just have this blank face, like, oh, yeah, I don't know this guy. And then he says, well, most people know me from this. And then he does the line. He goes, have you seen my baseball? <laughs> 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 and I was like, oh, I know who you are. I was like, that's awesome, man. And then, you know, we just talked a little bit more. But uh, I've always, you know, I'm never going to forget his face. So, of course, I see him show up here as a... Ben Chaplin's brother, and I mean, he looks nothing like he does in, and there's something about Mary or in Deadwood or like he looked when I met him. But I instantly, I go like, oh, he's there. He's looking for his baseball. That's awesome. Yeah, I, he's very, uh, his appearance is very regal here. So it kind of threw me off and it took me a minute. I, I was like, is that meatloaf? And then I had to like reassess and <laughs> figure out. But then, yeah, as soon as I looked up his name and, uh, saw his, um, filmography and i'm looking over it right now and i just remembered he is in the master he's the guy that fights joaquin in the uh like the photo booth 
that Joaquin's moving the light way too close to him and he gets pissed off yes. and like smacks him. Yeah. Holy shit. I did not recognize him then. For this shame. is no longer the summer of Winona. This is the appreciation of W. Earl Brown. <laughs> the minute that W. Earl Brown minute of appreciation. There you go. So Peter explains to his family that he's had this reoccurring dream slash nightmare uh, of him writing a book, finishing a book. And right before he wakes up, he sees on the last page of the back cover, I can't remember which, the the letters XES. And uh, jestingly, his family explains, hey, that's sex spelled backwards. You know, you're just having what, I don't know, a wet dream or some shit. I don't know. They make nothing of it, but they're just very dismissive of him having this reoccurring dream. Well, but his face, when they explained something that was so obvious, that XES is sex spelled backwards, his face is the face that I had when I figured out who uh, W.L. Brown was. <laughs> just that whole, like, oh, I'm a fucking idiot, and I just, and everybody saw it. Winona at her church and with her parishioners and pariahs and preachers and pastors is explaining, you know, She's doing this research on the devil and how she thinks it's going to inherit a human spirit, uh, kind of like the plot synopsis of the movie said earlier. And they're telling her to drop it. They, they're they telling her, you know, that we don't have time for this. You know, it's kind of like, um, uh, you know, I don't want to say all the president's men, but a movie based on journalism where they tell someone to stop the story because, you know, you're, you're getting too close to the fire. It's a spotlight. But if you didn't have uh, your boy Sabretooth and Michael Keaton... Supporting the reporters. Yes, exactly. Uh, and they just tell her to drop it. And so she she gets this moment of like reflection in the bathroom by herself because she's the only woman uh, that attends this church or practices, apparently. And we get kind of um, this is where the movie kind of turns into almost like a Silent Hill type thing where sometimes you can't tell what Winona is dreaming and what she's not. Uh, because right. she kind of the. The spirit of Satan is is haunting her. She knows she's right, and it's leading her into this like d- down this mental pit of despair. And the the fitting visual of the water circling down the drain, I think, uh, aptly represents her mental state at this point in the movie. Well, even more so after that, it's just the the, the fact that every toilet seems to overflow at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> That's scarier to me than I think anything else that happens in the movie. Yeah, uh, but it's very appropriate because I. I think that that's, like I said before, right? This is a movie about faith. And when Brandon Curtis, I love him, but when he says that this movie has nothing to say about faith or about Winona Ryder's beliefs and journey, that's, I think that he might have, uh, he might have missed the point. This uh, device where we don't, we can't tell for sure if she's hallucinating or if this is really happening Mm -hmm. and she can't tell either. That's what having faith is like. That's, you know, that's the whole point. That's what what defines faith is that there's no proof. So you're always just kind of believing on something that might be right and might not exist. The whole point of having faith is that you just kind of have to to go with 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 one of the options and just go all the way in. So uh, I think it's a very smart way of of touching that subject of dealing with that without actually having a single character verbalize it. It's just the movie doing it through the scares and through the the conflicts. Winona um, Maya drops in to meet Peter. She shows up just at his office and Winona Maya in this is, you know, a woman of Christ, but she also realizes she's a woman. Cause did you notice she showed up with her hair tied back and oh, looking? Dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She deployed her, her, her secret weapon, her, her femininity. It's not even, I think that he has, Kaminsky has a couple of shots before she goes where she's like putting lipstick on and, and just kind of fixing her makeup, which I love because she, she knows what she's doing. It just shows you that it's not that they put her in there and they decided, okay, well in this, in this scene, when our writer's going to look really hot, there is a purpose behind the way she looks. She knows that, uh, that Ben Chaplin is a dude and he's more likely to listen to her if she looks attractive or more attractive than usual. And she even drops on him when he answers her or when he answers his phone, she even drops on him. Was that your girlfriend? And yep. she like lights up a cigarette and, you know, she's uh, laying it on thick. And, and even to the point of tense, I said it's a tense first encounter. Yeah. The meet cute is not. It's like meet tense. Uh, and, and honestly, maybe my second favorite scene in the movie uh, other than the ending, you know, right after the ending. Because I just, Ben Chaplin, I want to take away from his performance, the way that he reacts to Winona Ryder's very forward intrusion into his life is mm-hmm. uh, 
It's the way that I think most of us would react, right? If if you're at work and you're trying to like finish something and then when a writer barges in, just smiling and, and being really uh, flirty, you would probably be as tongue tied and as as thrown off balance as Ben Chaplin is in this in this scene. It's it's great. Yeah, and um she eventually, you know, eases in using her sex appeal and just a tremendous flirtation to kind of get into the subject. She's like, hey, there's this Guy that, you know, you said there's no evil. I think there is. Here's a, a cassette tape of um, his exorcism so you can hear it. And he takes it back uh, that night to his apartment to play it. And at this point in the movie, I thought the tape was haunted and something was wrong with it because <laughs> he puts it on, you know, his um, cassette deck and he turns it up all the way and he can't hear anything. But, the you know, his this um, elderly woman in the apartment over is hearing everything that's going on. And it sounds very disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's basically the opening of the movie. But I I mean it it hit me at the same time. This is this is not the filmmaker's fault, it's not the movie's fault, but it's kind of the the unfortunate release or even the unfortunate production date, right? What is it like to be making a movie that has this very specific plot point where uh, audio has to be given to someone, has to be recorded and given to someone as proof uh, to advance the plot and you are at that time in history where, you know, it makes sense for you to use a cassette tape. Mm-hmm. But do you know that a year from now, <laughs> it's not going to make sense for the people watching it? So no. I'm watching and I'm like, this was released in 2000. Who was making tapes in 2000? And I feel bad. You know, I didn't uh, uh, I didn't blame the filmmakers, but it's just one of those things where, man, that sucks, right? If you were making your movie in 98, 99... And you're still not sure which way the industry is going to go. Uh, you're like, all right, fuck it. I guess we, she's going to give him a tape. And then now it's just, it, it takes her a little bit out of the movie. It's not their fault, but it's not just that she handed him a tape, but also that he had a tape player <laughs> when he got home. <laughs> and he was he was listening to music on tape before he put her tape in. So, you know, it's not like, oh, well, he had to dust his tape player off, like, you know, wherever he had it. It's like it was that's how he listened to music in his apartment. Well, I mean, he had the the combo deck there. He did have the CD outlet to it. I mean, I, I mean, I still have I have a three in one vinyl CD player and cassette. So, yeah, I but think, you're a hipster. I mean, you're well, <laughs> I think he was just cool and with it. But at the same time, I think it's really an indictment of the church and how out of how to out of touch they were. That they were that still offering cassette tapes. an excellent point. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I would totally expect... It does not surprise me to see that, that these uh, these priests... I mean, I'm surprised they weren't using an 8-track. It's just they would not move forward with technology. They go to visit Henry, uh, the now comatose Satan-inhibited gentleman. And this is where we learn that Winona, you know, Peter gave... Maya, an inch, and she took a mile. She's kind of taking advantage, posing as his secretary, et cetera, et cetera. But the well, main thing we learn here with with uh, Henry is that he's not in a coma. He opens his eyes and looks right at Maya, and understandably so, it freaks her the fuck out. But then he closes them, <laughs> so nobody oh, else yeah, can I mean, see it. Timing-wise. Yeah. The, the devil can't help himself again. He's like, I'm going to give her a little scare, even though it might blow my cover. I, I just love it. I, I love this characterization of the, of the devil as a playful... Uh, I guess, mastermind that doesn't mind risking his As master a, plan. A chaplain type who just kind of <laughs> throws a winking nod to you, the audience member. Yeah. <laughs> we cut to Casey Jones in prayer asking, you know, for the, the guidance and the light and what, what needs to be done. And then he, he climaxes at the end of his prayer as the light hits his face. And, uh, you know, if you ever want to see Casey Jones have an orgasm, this is... As I always allude to, as you talked about, who was the gentleman that played the the lizard in The Amazing Spider-Man? Oh, uh, I think it's Riss Eifen, maybe? Yeah, when he his arm grows back or whatever shit happens and he has that massive Peter North-esque orgasm right on camera. <laughs> yes. That's what happens here with Casey Jones. Uh, maybe that's why people pray. I, I don't know. I haven't prayed since I was a kid, so uh, and maybe I was too young to to achieve that. But maybe that's the whole reason that you know, <laughs> just prayer. a hands free ejac. That's what prayer leads to. <laughs> that's that's what you're hoping to achieve. It doesn't happen every time, but the ah. goal is that you know when you but get when the you prayer do, right. <laughs> yes. But when you do, you look like Casey Jones in this movie, and he sees the light literally and figuratively and potentially metaphorically. 
and he goes to this banquet and tries to kill Peter Kelson, and it is thwarted in the most brutal, comedic <laughs> way possible. He goes to shoot him. He pulls a gun out, a snub nose, and that's uh, foiled. And he falls back into the arms of Contrarian's new favorite, W. Earl Brown. And he just, like, brutally snaps his neck just right there. No rhyme or reason or restraint. Just I mean, he was threatening his brother. It. I, I know, but like uh, rhyme or reason is the wrong expression to use, but... Uh, no hesitation. Hostile force is... <laughs> you can tell he's done it before. Yeah, exactly. The way he like lined him <laughs> up and it's uh, Gina Davis in The Long Kiss Goodnight. She breaks like five <laughs> dudes' necks in that movie. But the, and, then, and then the follow-up is, you know, it's not like they're, they're taking W. Earl Brown to be detained at least until everything they don't even clear. question him they just he's like <laughs> he's sitting at the coffee. table yeah he's sitting at the table with fucking uh ben chaplin and the cop just comes up is like well my shift's over i'm out of here y'all have a good night <laughs> congratulations on the new book uh the way yeah. i uh, the way i rationalize it and uh I mean, it's pointless because by, by the end of the movie, it's explained, right? Why? But uh, it, the whole point is that they're at this uh, publisher's party that uh, Ben Chaplin's uh, hot blonde girlfriend said it's it's one of the most important events or whatever. And before his life is threatened, he's just basically in a circle of people and they're all like asking him questions and they're all being kind of assholes. And mm. so I think that in that climate... It, it just some dude snapping another dude's uh, neck off. It's just it's not a big deal. <laughs> I think that they're kind of used to it to that kind of callousness. Uh, so at the time when that happened, I was just like, all right, well, I guess that's how they party. I mean, those publishers are just are are pretty uh, uh, nasty people to begin with, and this is just like one more notch on the belt. They return back, you know. Uh, ben Chaplin's night just goes from bad to worse here. They return back to his apartment, and you know. Presumably to get a good night's sleep, and the the doorman's just like, "Hey, before you go up, your neighbor killed herself. She, you know, they say she hung herself, but there was no rope." He's giving like this extremely um, vague yet terrifying story that makes no sense. It makes it sound like she was murdered, and he's just like, "Well, have a good night." <laughs> and and also on her mirror, uh, she just spelled your name with blood. And <laughs> yes, said, I, I, I hope he stops playing that nasty music. Uh, so the implication is that she killed herself because she listened to the tape, right? Even mm-hmm. though it was through her wall. That's uh, that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty hardcore. That is the Satan played. that you know you're afraid of. If the movie had a bigger budget, they could have just done uh, Helter Skelter over and over again. That would have inspired <laughs> her to do that. Um, through this, Peter beca- starts to question God and question his life and his place on this earth and. Obviously, he's freaked out by the chain of events that have happened. Meanwhile, Maya, you know, is still trying to make sense of all this. She's trying to do what she thinks is right. But meanwhile, the church is telling her to stop. We get this kind of um, just bottle scene that doesn't, until the very end, doesn't really play back into things. But she's just at this diner and this little girl in red, which I think is the most color of any character in the movie, (laughs) comes up and very forward tells her to put her napkin in, in her lap and asks her if she has a daughter when she says no is like aren't you lonely she's kind of a little bitch and well, the entire time the mom is is just like a couple feet away just kind of smiling it's like oh, isn't she cute isn't it awesome how uh how grown up she is that's the equivalent of those fuckers that just let their kids do whatever and you know kids will be kids uh <laughs> but winona better than myself handles it with great aplomb and just kind of like yeah okay <laughs> Meanwhile, she's completely melting down internally. Well, yeah, because she just found out that Casey Jones is dead. Mm-hmm. So, so she went to that cafe to grieve, and this little girl just won't leave her alone. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first point in the movie where we find out that Winona is a teacher at the church, at the school, the the church school, what have you. Because we don't see any other shots of her teaching a class until this. And I don't even know what she's doing. She's just showing pictures, and I guess the kids are just saying what the word is in Latin. I think it's French. I just started okay. uh, learning French, and it sounded like it was French, but I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. We know, not let us know. <laughs> yes, please respond in a timely fashion. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we saw her at the very beginning of the movie. I, I think the opening shot of the movie is her... Uh, kind of playing with some kids, but you don't know that she's a teacher. I mean, at that point, you could assume that that kid is her son, 
right? But she's at a park, and then John Hurt shows up and you know shines a bad signal at her, and then she gets in the car. But uh, but yeah, this is the first time that you see it. Uh, this is when Ben Chaplin confronts her about what's going on, and I yeah, guess dude just wanders into the school. And <laughs> yeah. is just like. And then this interrupts the class, doesn't even kindly wait for her. He's just like, get the fuck out here. <laughs> this is like, this is when, when they kick it up a notch as far as acting. They, they're they both sexiness. in the play. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, there's some some uh, really aggressive whispering going back and forth in this scene. Oh, yeah. I, I, I really appreciated it. It was, it was time. You know, the movie had been playing for a while and we needed something to kick things up a notch. Kick it up, it did. Uh, as we transition now, with um I, I didn't catch who this was a potentially a religious uh historian of some sort is in Peter's office and as his madness continues to drive him, uh the XES comes back into the play and we learn <laughs> that that is actually the number six 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 and was it no uh, Roman numerals or Latin? Uh I think it said Greek. Greek, I, okay. Yeah, I don't know. It was it was obviously a, a language that Ben Chaplin was not familiar with. Which you know, just further freaks him out. He's like, get the fuck out of here. And obviously he is um, starting to believe it. And he is beside himself with concern. He... Yeah. And then the assistant goes like, uh, I'm really sorry. He's like, get out. I don't, <laughs> I don't have time for, I don't have time for more sexual tension in my life. Me and Winona Ryder is enough. Yes. And then he meets her in a park the next day, as all good detective movies do when you're, you know, keeping things under wraps, you just meet in a public park and she's done quite the detective work and just casually drops on him that, uh, yeah, you were born of incest. <laughs> and Ben Chaplin is like, no, I was not. <laughs> He's more concerned with like, I was baptized. What are you talking about? <laughs> And so at this point, she explains to him what's happened and that it essentially looks like he was groomed for this position for Satan to come back to Earth and inherit his being, his vessel. Right. Uh, And so what she's saying is that Phil Baker Hall is his father. Correct. uh, His uncle is his dad. Right. She says he was your mother's only brother. And I just told you that you were born out of incest. So you do the math. Uh, Also... The person that allegedly baptized you is your uncle, who in seven years of being a priest only baptized one person, you. So that was probably not a legit baptism. <laughs> and yes. she's just dropping all this truth on Ben Chaplin, and he's just kind of... I I just love that the camera... Kaminsky knew to to hold the camera on him, because you, you can see his facial reactions as he's processing all this information. And like you said, the, the biggest hit... And it makes sense, right? When... When you get hit with this much, uh, this much new information, you kind of have to process it in in little parts. So I can totally understand that to him, the incest part was way too much. He needed to start smaller. So his first his first approach was like, well, let's handle the baptism part first. I have been baptized, <laughs> and and then you know things spiral out from there. They continue to look for clues. Uh, they. Is this? Are they ransack? Not ransacking, but are they searching through the church? I mean, this because oh, of the it's Casey Jones's uh, house. That's right. I I apologize, but because of again, I mentioned my respect for the conservative light bill in this movie, but it does make a lot of the settings <laughs> blend together, so it's easy to kind of <laughs> you got to keep up. Uh, but they go on the, the hunt, and then they find out here, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, is uh, they find out that it's set to take form over him uh, on the moment of his 33rd birthday, like basically the 33rd year of the moment of his birth. And then he just casually drops, oh, my God, my birthday's in two days. <laughs> yeah, it's not even it's even more specific than that, though. It's at exactly the same time that he was born. So. Not only do they have a date, but they have a time. I guess like four fifty-five, uh, which is again. I just love the fact that Satan would be that specific. It's like, yes, Batman, you must do it by this time. Yeah, it really seems like Satan would be more of like the Spectrum or Time Warner. Uh, it'll be between nine a.m. and eleven p.m. <laughs> and then because he's Satan, he wouldn't show up, and you'd have to they... reschedule. <laughs> Yes, or he'll wait and you're in the bathroom and then slap that sticker on there that, sorry we missed you. <laughs> they find Henry once more. Uh, I believe they're back at the church, and he comes to kill Winona. He's obviously, uh, he's basically like a fucking slasher villain at this point. He's completely overtaken by Satan. 
she is able to get away in basically a moment of talking him down and pulling a cross out and putting it in his face. But um, it's all for naught as Satan tires of this body. And we basically watch him just self mutilate and fold his body up in all weird types of contortions. It's crazy because obviously by now the movie has trained us to believe that whenever something this crazy happens, if it's not in Winona Ryder's head, at the very least, it's something that's not really physical, so she can't really be hurt, right? We saw him approach her in the bathroom when she had that that episode before, and then we had the the little girl at the at the cafe, and and so now when he's coming at her with a knife, she's like, "I know this is not true," and then he cuts her. <laughs> so. Yeah, they. Find out, which is pretty easy to deduce after watching the situation with Henry, that if they don't stop the transformation, Peter's going to die. Um, in transition, he finds that there's a giant pentagram. Was that his office ceiling that it was above? No, it's uh, so it's technically the the apartment under his. So it's his floor. That's because- where he sleeps. He sleeps over it. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, so what happens is he he throws a tantrum, and he he accidentally breaks his girlfriend's portrait that he had on his nightstand or something, and then he finds two keys behind the portrait, and he figures out that those keys are for the apartment under his. So he goes in, and then he finds a pentagram, and uh, you know he reacts like I think any of us would. He he finally believes he's the Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> he he has nothing else left to believe. Uh, he comes back to his apartment and his attractive blonde counterpart is there. Winona Ryder's also there. And at this point, he's completely freaked out, uh, rightfully so. She knows no other way of resolution but to grab a gun and she tries to shoot it at Winona Ryder. It goes off in the tussle, but to my understanding, no one was actually shot. Really? I thought that the blonde got killed. But I could be wrong. I mean, we never see her again, right? I thought she was at the church at the end. Was she? I mean, it could be that Satan brought her back. Because if nobody got hurt, then what happened to the blonde after this? Like in between, you know, this moment and and then the the ending of the church. She just hung out at the apartment? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cuz that was the way I took it is already in this movie, uh Ben Chaplin's brother snapped someone's neck and there wasn't like it wasn't a big deal. So I just assumed that here, Winona in self-defense killed his girlfriend, and it was just like, all right, well, shit happens. We got we, we got bigger things to worry about. Satan is coming. Well, just adds to the mystique of lost souls, whether or not the blonde <laughs> died. Uh, did the blonde die? That's a, that's a question on the on the movie's website. That's That'll be the poll on our Twitter account. Did the blonde <laughs> die? So John Hurt, the overarching father, the godfather in many ways of this church, uh, comes back to and explains to Maya that, you know, there are things that are wrong and things that we uh, sometimes screw up and there's going to be no transformation. Satan's not going to inherit a human vessel like you would think, which, again, is just what Satan would want you to believe. Right. <laughs> we don't know this. Thankfully, by now, the movie has established her as somebody that's smart enough that she would pick up on this. So so all we need is a close up of her for like a couple seconds for us as the audience to realize, Oh no, she's onto him. Yeah. And she pulls out her crucifix and puts it to his head and it makes like a sizzling sound, like, you know, a fucking <laughs> a sausage patty on a skillet. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, that's when John Hurt gets to uh, ham it up for a little bit because now he's revealed as, I guess, being the new, the new host, the new vessel mm-hmm. for, for Satan. He says something like, uh, yeah, Jesus will walk through shit or something. I don't know. It's just something that's like, I, I get it. It's it's going for shock value to see John Hurt we'll, saying something we'll like that. Will make Jesus crawl, I think is what he says. Yeah. Uh, but it also felt pretty tame, all things considered. Uh, it felt like the, the, the previous manifestation of the demon when it was, you know, uh, the, the other guy, uh, he was a lot harsher, a lot like cruder. In, in his mm-hmm. mannerisms. And John Hurt, I guess he can't help but be John Hurt even when he's possessed. And John Hurt has been overtaken, but we see here Satan is basically like uh, the coronavirus. They're just coughing it back and forth at people at this point. <laughs> and it's just, in, it's going back and forth to different people. Uh, you're going to have to explain to me what happened here because uh, we're, we're kind of seeing things from Peter's perspective and he's obviously fever dreaming. 
Were they trying to sacrifice Winona at one point? It looked like they had her by the throat and were, you know, just Gregorian chants at her. I, I I had a hard time piecing this together. I mean, Alex, I wish I had answers for you, but I, I, like I said earlier, I, I kind of walked away from Catholicism a while ago. So <laughs> what they do in their weird rituals is just kind of a mystery to me. I, I was like Ben Chaplin and like you. When we got a peek into what was going on in that room, I was just kind of horrified and pretty lost. Uh, as, as much as I could piece it together, they were trying to exercise... Satan out of John Hurt. And the process to do that is to lock themselves in a room with him and then just, I don't know, have at it. It, it, uh, At times it looks like it's a rave. At times it looks like, uh, like they're all trying to hurt each other. At times it looks like it's an orgy. Uh, It's once again, great on Ben Chaplin's acting on one end, because he is reacting the way that I, would have reacted as far as just not knowing what the fuck's going on. His, you can tell on his face that he's confused. At some point, he even gets the the Nightmare on Elm Street special effect. I'm sure you love that when uh, yes. he approaches a wall and then Freddy comes out <laughs> or almost the comes Frighteners out. The Frighteners VHS case is always what I think of. Yes. <laughs> uh, but then also Kaminsky, I think, is just kind of going the distance in depicting how... Uh, just inscrutable the church's proceedings can be to someone like you or me or you know so many of the people watching this movie that are not uh catholics right uh, mm-hmm. you just kind of have to believe that well it makes sense for them because that's that's what they do that's uh you know when in rome and all that stuff it's just if you have faith then you kind of have faith all the way and that means believing that these sort of rituals uh are gonna give you any sort of results so they they break away from the the school and make their way to the sanctuary to where I guess Winona thinks she's just going to solo this exorcism. And then they get there and there's like this fucking massive congregation. And Father James is like, he has some quippy boss uh, Bond villain one liner of <laughs> you always knew it would end this way. And <laughs> again, this is where I believe his blonde fiance was seated. But we definitely see his brother and we see that little bitch uh, from the diner in the red dress. She's sitting there. Uh, we and see Miranda from Sex and the City, right? For real? <laughs> it it looked like her, but <laughs> from no. s- I was gonna say the first time I've been marathoning that show. I, I feel like I would recognize if it was actually Cynthia Nixon. It was the first not time I watched Cynthia it. Nixon. <laughs> the first time I watched it, I thought, "Wow, Miranda from Sex and the City," and then I thought, "No, it must be the girl's mom." And then the second time I watched it, it's definitely not the girl's mom. So. It's just some random redhead that they they focus on when they're showing you all the yeah. you, you know because everybody else no is way no way movie. that was Cynthia Nixon because <laughs> Sex in the City was already off the ground at this point. Quit playing with my head, Julio. But it could be you know Kaminsky just pulled a few favors just to say you know it would be fun if Miranda was sitting there. <laughs> She's part of the the dark forces trying to overtake our planet. That was like uh, Lillian. My sister was arguing with me. Uh, I because I was telling her Alicia Silverstone's in the last scene of Tropic Thunder, and she's like, "No, she's not." And I'm, I'm like, "That's the whole point of her being there is that it's just Alicia Silverstone with no attention drawn to it, right?" Um. So anyway, Father James, uh, Philip Baker Hall, he's the bad guy. He's like, "I did this all for you. You're gonna have unlimited power." We learn, per usual, the Church of Satan is just a bunch of fucking white people, and um. <laughs> W. Earl Brown's like, yes, it's going to be great, brother. And <laughs> Ben Chaplin goes crazy. He eventually shoots uh, Philip Baker Hall and he fucking shoots his own brother in the face. It's pretty brutal. So this is awesome because the the, the movie sets you up to believe that this is going to be a, a, a Return of the Jedi moment mm-hmm. at the end, right? Where Winona is telling him, don't kill him because if you give in to murder, you're giving in to evil. And that just confirms that you're... You're the Antichrist. But Ben Chaplin doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> Evil shoots. with a, cap, a capital E on that. Yeah, he just shoots him. And, I mean, we kind of cut away, so we don't really get to see how many more people in that church he shot. Right? He starts with Philip Baker Hall. He moves on to his brother. Next thing you know, it's just like they're running and getting into the car. And then they just drive to an underpass, and they just kind of hang out, and they're going to see, hey, what happens at 455? And then it becomes 455. And she po- she has the gun pointed at his face at point blank range. And he like squinches his face up really tight. Like, you know, he's about to get a shot or something. And then 
uh, the moment passes and he's like, nothing happened. And then the <laughs> the digital clock flickers and it changes from 455 to 666. And then he gets kind of the shit eating grin on his face. And that's <laughs> that's all Maya needs to see. Winona, you know, uh, licks a shot off and just shoots him right between the eyes. And then to ensure that the, the devil's gone and the spirit has left us uh, or the evil's gone, as Donald Pleasance would say, she shoots him right in the heart, too. And then she just gets out of the car and walks away. Directed by, because that's, uh, we go to black and that's it. Yeah, and End of the World by R.E.M. starts playing over the end credits. <laughs> I, But, you know, I don't think it's as He's not kidding, dry. by the way. That's literally what happens. She shoots him, gets out of the car, and the credits roll. Yeah, well, because what else is there to say, right? Uh, I think that anything else that you said, that you showed us after this, would uh, dilute the point. To me, the point is that Winona Ryder had to act on faith in this in this climax. Like, she's been through the entire movie. If mm-hmm. if you believe, then you're all in. If you believe that he's the Antichrist and that at 455 he becomes the Antichrist, then it doesn't matter it's 456 and he still looks like Ben Chaplin. You still have to kill him. That's just the whole point. And, and faith means that you're going to spend the rest of your life wondering if you did the right thing. Because she's never going to know if if she imagined that 666 flashing on the clock. And she's never going to know what that, that facial expression from uh, Ben Chaplin meant. I mean, was it really a, a grin as in like, oh, I almost got you? Or was it a grin uh, as in like, oh, fuck, we've been bested, right? I mean, did Satan flash that 666 independently of having possessed Ben Chaplin? You know, he just flashed it so that when a writer would kill an innocent? I think it's entirely possible. I mean, if, if, if this movie has proven anything, it's that Satan can't be trusted to play by the rules or even to behave by the, you know, according to the idea of Satan that we're taught in in school. So uh, I just love that we're basically left, like Winona, to wonder if she did the right thing. Yeah, and then, like, the movie itself leaves you wondering, well, maybe when everyone was right about Winona and she is crazy. That Maybe this wasn't anything to begin with at all, and she just created this whole situation. And it's uh, it, it leaves you pondering, and that's what a lot of movies these days don't do. They just go out of their way to over-explain every single aspect of it. This, you know, had I seen this in the theater, I would have left, you know, scratching my head for days. You would have gone to a diner and just, you know, had a coffee or two. Try to entangle your feelings about it. Been as impatient about children as I am today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but also, I mean, you could also argue that it's not even uh, that Winona was maybe imagining everything. It's just that everybody was imagining something, right? Because Philip Baker Hall, whether he was uh, uh, directed by Satan or just acting, following the voices in his head that don't really mean anything... He assembled a whole bunch of people <laughs> that truly believed or truly seemed to believe that that uh, Ben Chaplin was the Antichrist. So, I mean, they were yeah. not a hallucination <laughs> and they really got shot. But it could be, I mean, I just love if the whole point of the movie or one of the points I could be making is just that uh, Satan may not even be real. Or if he's real, he's just kind of taking a back seat and watching humanity go at it, fight each other, hurt each other, kill each other. Uh, in his name, even though he's really not doing anything. You know, he's watching this whole story of Ben Chaplin happen, and he's like, oh, well, I'll throw in a couple of hallucinations here and there, but uh, but really, these guys are doing all the work for me. Did you watch all the way through the credits? Uh, no. Did I miss uh, Captain America's cameo at the very end? After the credits are over and, you know, you get the official seal of the MPAA, uh, it just cuts back to the church where everyone's just sitting in silence, and one guy in the back goes, well, what do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh which yeah is really the, the satan church they really they hinged a lot on uh old chaplain just agreeing to do what they wanted him to and when he did not i'm curious if they're uh what's the line uh philip baker hall had they've had the previous two thousand years it's our time now <laughs> all right let's go to real talk i believe in god and the devil in fact i know that they exist you know why we're here. I'm going in with you. You wouldn't last five minutes. Once you face evil, true evil, you discover something. Peter Kelson, I assume you're familiar with the case of Henry Birdson. 
Yeah, what's that got to do with you? At the exorcism, Birdson boasted that Satan was about to take over the body of a man. You are that man, Peter. I know you don't believe me. Why should I? I was possessed once. The time of transformation is near. They've contaminated you. What would have happened to me? You have no idea. Hello? They had their 2,000 years. Now it's our turn. I'm always scared that I could be one of them. All right. I am recording for Real Talk for Lost Souls. Excellent. Lost Souls is a movie released on October 13th, 2000, directed by Janus uh, Kaminsky, screenplay by Pierce Gardner. Not overly familiar with Mr. Gardner's work, uh, but Mr. Kaminsky, as we had mentioned, is a two-time Academy Award winner for Best Cinematography, starring Miss Winona Ryder and Ben Chaplin. This movie was initially supposed to be released in October of 1999, its trailer was in theaters in summer of 99. However, due to a flood of end-of-world movies coming out the same year, End of Days and Stigmata are in parentheses, the decision was made to delay the release. Its new release date was February 4th, 2000. However, that date was canceled as after the popular Scream franchise staked out that date for Scream 3. The final release date of October 13th, 2000 was finally decided upon, which also happened to be the same day as the re-release of The Exorcist. <laughs> why not and as you had mentioned on a previous episode one of the most widely known things about this movie at least the behind the scenes you know the extracurricular information was that upon the movie's release uh, much was made of the fact that Winona Ryder chose not to do any promotional work for the movie um, because the movie had been done for so long the contractual obligation to promote it lapsed so she didn't have to so, I mean, can you blame her? I mean, I don't no. know. I, I, On one end, I just, obviously, she had seen it, and she might have just been wanting to cut her losses. Also, as far as I can tell, this was just that, that really dark period in her life where she was dealing with, you know, depression and the whole thing with the shoplifting charges and all that stuff. So, I guess promoting a movie that was not good was not high on her <laughs> priority list. But at the same time, I can also feel how, on a general basis, I think film crews are kind of, they become a family, you're a team, right? And that has to have felt a little bit like a betrayal to suddenly have a star that doesn't want to promote the movie. You know, there's no way that, you know, we can't know exactly how they got to that point, right? Uh, but I can feel like maybe Kaminsky, Ben Chaplin, feeling a little hurt that she wasn't around at the at the press conferences, at the junkets. At the same time, it's like like you just said, I mean, I don't, know, I don't blame her for not wanting to put herself through that. No, and I mean, based on just the subject matter of the movie, and she obviously was no, she was not wet behind the ears in the industry any longer. I'm sure she could see it probably wasn't gonna uh, set the world on fire, and it did not <laughs> with a uh, budget of fifty million and a box office return of slightly over thirty million. It was, I believe, what you call a box office bomb. And being a 8% movie on Rotten Tomatoes, also a critical bomb. To answer your question, though, in uh, my opinion, no. And also, uh, you know, um, if she had no contractual obligation, cool. I mean, there are people that have passion projects, they believe in it, but I'm pretty sure she just needed to pass the time with this. And I would much rather that than because it's way, way more depressing to see someone doing promotional material for a movie that doesn't fucking care about it. Like um, Red 2. I remember watching a press <laughs> junket with Bruce Willis and um, who's the homegirl on that? Oh, uh, the girl from Weeds. Mary Louise Parker? There you go. I always want to say Laura Flynn Boyle, but I know that's wrong. Mary Louise Parker and Bruce Willis run a press junket and just wanted to be anywhere else in the world. And uh, I think Bruce Willis even said at one point he hadn't watched the movie yet. And it so... <laughs> So, yes, I'm on Team Winona on this one if there are people that are upset about uh, the situation. But um, 
Julio, being 8% does mean that someone logged on to Al Gore's internet and said something nice about it. <laughs> yes, uh, and it wasn't Al Gore. There were a few people, uh, one of them, Kathy Thompson Georges from Box Office Magazine, who said, It's still a little smarter and a little more interesting than most entries in the Antichrist genre and packs more than one satisfying scare. Now, given when this was released, I kind of feel like she is taking a swipe at those movies that you mentioned, uh, End of Days and uh, Stigmata, which I've seen both. I don't think either of them were particularly memorable. I already told you the one thing I remember about End of Days and Stigmata, I just remember being freaked out by the idea. Was it like the the, the wounds that Christ uh, received while on the cross, I think, manifest themselves on someone? <laughs> and it's supposed to be a sign of divinity? I don't know. But Anyway, I I mean, is this movie smarter than those? I don't know. I, I, I think it definitely tries to be, but uh, I don't know. To be discussed. Um, then we have Bob Thomas from the Associated Press, who says, Well plotted, with a first-class group of actors, and shorthanded direction by Steven Spielberg's favorite cinematographer, Janusz Kaminski. Mm-hmm. Uh, sort of agree with some of that. Uh, and then finally, Ian Mangani from UK Critic says, Already I'm looking forward to Kaminsky's next picture. With Jesus. a good script. <laughs> he says, With a good script, this guy could be dangerous. Um, the implication there that this isn't a good script. So, backhanded compliment? I was trying to think about possession movies we've done. I guess I must just, I'm going through our website right now. I must just be thinking of. Uh, New Nightmare, because that, I think, would qualify as a possession movie. Otherwise, yeah. I'm not entirely sure. Well, I can't even think of uh, just religious movies we've done. Because I was thinking, no. I didn't go through the list, but, you know, it's... And there aren't that many, or... I mean, that's not true. <laughs> there are plenty of religious movies, but as far as... There, uh, I, there aren't that many good ones. Like, I was thinking of good possession movies, and I was like, well, there's The Exorcist, and yeah. I'm ready for the next topic. <laughs> Uh, there's that movie with Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer. I haven't seen it, but I own it. I think it's directed by Robert Zemeckis, actually. Hell yeah. Rob, um, yeah, and I guess New Nightmare is good. Um, it's a hard thing to tell because it's such a hard... Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and preface this with, you know, we t- talked about religion a little bit. Julio was raised Catholic. I was raised Lutheran. Uh, no judgment of people that celebrate religion or believe in believe in what you want to believe in. That's the danger of a lot of societal problems now is telling people what they need to believe in religiously, especially. I think yep. that uh, it's very difficult to create a mainstream movie based on things that can be interpreted as fallacy um, on a different level than like fucking Iron Man or Superman or, you know, something like that, that with movies like this, you try to play it with a certain sense of realism, but then you have these, there's a certain level of cynicism built in with a lot of people that aren't religious that aren't going to really give a shit about this to begin with. It's, it's not, um, it's not a fruitful path to take really, in my opinion, uh, I mean, The Exorcist is awesome, but that was also like a game changing film. And really, when's the last time you saw The Exorcist? Uh, that would be never. <laughs> I've seen The Exorcist 3 and The Exorcist 4. And the first the Exorcist, I've seen like you? bits and pieces. What is wrong with you? I'm not a horror person, so it's not a priority. I mean, I will get to it eventually. You're a, a movie person, so it should be a priority. There's a lot of movies that come before The Exorcist. You're an idiot. Uh, that, <laughs> the point I is, also, if you've seen, I bought that uh, Rosemary's Baby, and it's oh, it's a, also in the queue. That's a great movie too, but it's not in the same zeitgeist as fucking The Exorcist. Wasn't The Exorcist? Uh, I know it was nominated for Best Picture. What is? What was I thinking of? Was it? Um, no, Clockwork Orange. I was trying to think of the only X-rated movie that got nominated for Best Picture, and that would be Clockwork Orange. But huh. anyway, quit being an idiot. Watch The Exorcist. <laughs> I'll but what watch I was it going before to, the end of the year. What I was going to say is that the difference with that movie is there's a lot of uh, geographical elements to the story. It's not just all this insane 
religious theology behind it. And that is a compliment to The Exorcist and also a detriment to this movie. If you are going to do something like this, you have you can't half-ass it. You cannot and that's the problem with so many possession movies and movies uh based on religious stories and iconography is that well, you know, it's about Jesus, so we can just kind of, you know, keep it kind of loosey goosey. And with movies like this, with the subject matter, you have to keep it tight. Uh, shout out to Xavier Woods. That's how he always signs off his show. But it's <laughs> you can't make a lazy movie with this. Otherwise, your audience is not going to care. And I think this is the definition of a lazy movie in almost every aspect. So because of that, of course, the movie fucking suffers. It's, it's just boring and you don't care. And then honestly, with a movie like this, if you want to play it straight like this, but then at the end you have like this giant, you know, Satan like creature come out of the, the ground or something like that, that could have saved it. If they did, if the ending was like something completely, uh, you know, it's where the entire budget went and they just do this <laughs> ridiculous showdown at the end. But instead she just shoots him in the head and walks out of the car and we're done. Well, to me, that's I, I actually that's what I enjoyed at the very end. And I don't know how much of it is just me projecting what I wanted the movie to be versus what Kaminsky and, and his team were trying to to communicate or whatever. But uh on a less passionate level than what I was saying could transcorder, but I like that basically the ending is just her shooting somebody that may or may not be the Antichrist in, you know, just kind of like walking out, uh, walking out of the car and, and that's it. Cause what else are you going to do? Uh, I don't think that the movie, that's a good job of building up to that. Right. I just, I had to make myself get to that point by sheer force of will, because I was trying to look for positive things to say about the movie. But yeah. uh, I, I think the elements to tell a captivating story are there, right? If you have a large group of people that believe, and I'm not saying that this is every Catholic or every Christian person or whatever, right? But if there is enough mythology for to, for you to establish, believably, there's a group of people that believe that the ultimate representation of evil will assume human form at some point. And uh, they follow the signs. He wins the presidency. <laughs> the signs were there all along. The pentagram <laughs> on the top floor of Trump Tower. Uh, That's what's under his hair is the pentagram. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, you have a group of people that believe that and believe it intensely uh, to the point where they will do anything to prevent it. And then you have a series of signs that that could be you know, interpreted as pointing out to this one person, this one person that doesn't even share those beliefs, somebody who's, you know, like Ben Chaplin's character, who's just a man of no faith. He doesn't believe in anything. And so now you have these people hunting that person down and you have maybe one person in the middle that, you know, the winner writer character that knows what needs to be done, but doesn't feel comfortable doing it. Well, you can spin an interesting movie out of that. It just doesn't happen here. And that's not, you know, yeah, I agree that, that if you delved, uh, more deeply into what makes these beliefs uh, become an option for 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 a community, then yes, you you would have something that hits harder, that that hits uh, that's more meaningful. But because it's just reduced to the very basic elements of a horror movie, then you don't really get anything, right? It's just well, we're gonna see John Hurt proclaim a prayer while this guy thrashes around uh, while he's tied to a chair and that's supposed to be scary or disturbing just because you know that's what we're trained to 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 see but we don't really get the meaning behind all of that right uh, we see we're not a writer in a flashback being possessed and now she's not but but what does that really mean for somebody as as a person you know there it, it's all a lot of like surface scares even though the movie is shot and it's paced as something that would seem like it's aiming for something deeper. Um, the problem is that it isn't. So, I, I mean, I found it boring, and I think that you did too. Yes. Um, and I'm glad you had uh, had you to kind of hold my hand through it because uh, I paid pretty good attention to it. I mean, I was bored, so I would be reading about something else on the side, it, about the movie or the director or something like that. But even still, if I had paid really close attention, I think I would have had a hard time. Uh, all the settings look exactly the same. That's really what threw me off about where they were at certain times, just because it's so dark and everything is like the same palette color and 
so the mon the mundane nature of the the movie to begin with, the mundane nature of the setting and presentation is boring enough, and then the actual movie. I have in my notes here, and I didn't bring it up in Contrarian's Corner because there's no way to really leverage it into a comedic bit. This is a very this would be a very mid video game. This is like um, one of the lower tier Silent Hill movies in in the sense of the story is really weak and the dialogue's weak and the payoff's weak. But if I was playing this as a video game, I would be like, well, I got to see what happens. But since it's a movie, I just have no interest in it. Like, hey, if this was a book, yeah, there's no way I'd finish it. Just if, if the <laughs> I was bored and it kept it concise and there was enough kind of ha ha, that's cool type things with like the Satan church at the end. But overall, yeah, it was not for me, especially having just recently watched um Eye of the Devil, that 70s, was that 60s? It'd be a 60s horror movie with Sharon Tate and Donald Pleasance. It has a similar sacrifice in the name of Satan type thing. And it was good and really intriguing and interesting. And I mean, the sto- that story is interesting. This guy's been raised just to be, like become the, the harbinger of evil in the, the world. And they still find a way to make that just boring. It's it's really a, an admirable feat. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, it's really it's kind of puzzling. But at the same time, you know, like all the stuff that I know that should be scary. It, it, that's my problem with so many horror movies, right? Uh, that I have a problem with the genre because when they try to be scary, I just find it kind of silly. And uh, and this this movie makes all the mistakes that that those movies make, except that it's kind of wrapped around in false advertising, right? Because, like I said, the way it's shot, and even, you know, I would say, like, the caliber of the cast and all that stuff makes you think that you're in for something bigger. But, I, I mean, I kept pointing it out in Contreras Corner, but the, the the Satan's master plan, to me, doesn't make any sense. And I know that's that can be one of those things where people just roll their eyes and are like, well, you have to go with it because that's, it's that kind of movie. But I don't know that this movie was supposed to be like that. It doesn't feel... to like it to me right and so to me when yeah. really dumb stuff that you would think that you know satan at least the way that he's sold to us in this movie and the way that pop culture has sold him to to us you know would be above such things as you know leaving uh, uh ben chaplin's name encoded for we writer to find you know that that kind of stuff is just like why I mean, is he, if his goal is to make sure that Ben Chaplin makes it to his 33rd birthday, then why, you know, throw around clues that might help when our writers stop that? You know, why do you have uh, all these people kind of arranging things? Like, by the time that you get to the church, uh, the big, you know, church of evil people at the end, it's just... To me, it's just funny to see them all congregated. It's it's entertaining, at least, but it's funny. I mean, I can't take the movie seriously. And even like at the very end, like I said, in the corner, the fact that he flashes the six 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 on the clock. What's the point of that? <laughs> so fucking hokey. Yeah. So I can't take it seriously, but at the same time, you know, I, I it's not like the movie is giving me an out by saying no. You're just supposed to have fun with this because it's just so ponderous. The way it's lit, it's just so so dark and it's screaming for you to take it seriously i'm fine with the performances i think when a writer ben chaplin do about as as well as they can but but they don't really have a story supporting it i mean is this your do you have do you know ben chaplin from anything else no i didn't even look at his filmography i mean his face looked familiar but i'm not entirely sure that i could uh, well i know that i couldn't point to anything else he's been in so uh what do you know him from um i think i actually mentioned this movie uh, before, maybe even because I mentioned Ben Chaplin, but uh, there's this uh, Janine Garofalo, Hugh, Uma Thurman romantic comedy where they're both after Ben Chaplin. It's called uh, The Truth About Cats and Dogs, I think. So he's I a romantic the lead for that. There. Yeah. Uh, he's one of the main characters in The Thin Red Line. So this, I think those are the two most uh, notable features. And I was, I looked at the filmography uh, earlier because I thought. To me, it feels like he's falling off the face of the earth. But if you look at filmography right now, I mean, he's been working. It's just that, you know, he's not a an A-lister, at least uh, right now. Uh, but I guess he kind of was back in the 90s. He's good. I mean, I think that all things considered, when the movie doesn't work, it's not because of him or because of Winona Ryder. I think Winona Ryder is doing, you know... I, I really... I wasn't kidding. My, my favorite scene in the movie is when they meet for the first time 
because at least it feels like the movie's alive for like five minutes <laughs> because she's being flirtatious and he's being Oh yeah, that's my favorite dude. scene. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it just felt like it was set in the real world. But then, you know, whenever it was trying to be scary or, or creepy, it just it, it just felt so uh, artificial. I don't know. And that's, you know, that's from somebody, like I said, I was raised Catholic. So I've, I, you know, I've grown with the iconography and with the, at least a very basic concept of good versus evil, God versus the devil and all that stuff. But, you know, when he goes and he, uh, he goes up to a church and he, he talks to a crucifix, a giant crucifix, and then the crucifix falls, <laughs> like uh, becomes inverted. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that reminded me of like a video game sequence. Like it would fall, and you would find the next clue behind it, or something like that. I thought that <laughs> it reminded me of Spider Man. It looked like Jesus was gonna give him the upside down kiss. So, correction to my previous statement: uh, Eye of the Devil was 1966. It was not a 70s movie. I feel ashamed for saying that because, of course, Sharon Tate passed away in 1969, and then um, uh, I was right in that The Exorcist was nominated for Best Picture. Uh, the year it was nominated was 1973, looks like, at the 46th Academy Awards. Julio, shot in the dark. Do you have any idea what else would have been nominated or what would have won in 1973? 73, man, that's really, really early. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Chariots of Fire. I don't know. <laughs> that's the 80s. <laughs> uh, the Sting was what won that year. And uh, the only other movie that was nominated that I've seen was American Graffiti. Oh, I've seen that one. I, I for some reason, had in my mind it was nominated the same year as Star Wars, but that wasn't for another four years, I want to say, three years. Okay, that wouldn't make sense. That would mean that George Lucas had the biggest year of his career. I know. That's why I'm saying, like, it's it's ba- ass backwards now, but uh, <laughs> for some reason I always thought they were side by side. But yeah, yeah, your movie beat out Star Wars that year. My movie? Annie Hall. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, well, you know, sometimes they get it right. It's all, it's, it always tickles me colored pink, uh, thinking about, especially with what it's become and its fan base and how just th- there's no one that hates a Star Wars movie than a Star Wars fan. That the first Star Wars was nominated for fucking best picture. That, that always <laughs> simpler it's, times. It's, yeah, and it seems it's one of those movies too, like Rocky. Like I've had people laugh at me when I talk about Rocky winning Best Picture. They're like, "That never happened." I'm like, mm, "No, it did." Uh, you just need to know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> well, that's a good, uh, uh, actually, point to make. Uh, just as far as being a devil's advocate for this movie, is it would this movie fare better if The Exorcist didn't exist? If the field of possession slash uh, Antichrist movies, like, you know, The Omen is another one, uh, was, I mean, I don't want to say that it's distinguished, you know, but if, if it felt like it was at least doing something new, which it doesn't, you know, because even I, who haven't seen that many of, of those movies, I still felt like we were just hitting the same notes most of the time. But if you were to take it in isolation... Yeah, but- you can you can make fucking so the movie Goodfellas exi- Goodfellas exists and the movie Casino exists and the movie The Departed exists and they're all pretty much the same movie but they're all fucking incredible and you know I obviously that's Scorsese one of the greatest filmmakers in the history of the world but the the point is you can make a movie about a subject that's been done before and still make it good this is just very uninspired very uh, massive lack of focus. And I believe you said this. It's not from lack of trying. None of the performances are bad. Everyone in the movie seems like they want to be there or at least is good enough to give the impression that they you know, are giving 100%. It's just the, the direction of the movie is so lazy and paint by numbers. Um, I, I, as a horror fan, I, I've watched the same version of the, of a movie eight million times in my life, but can still decipher, you know, which version of it's good and which isn't. And I think that's a, a prime example here. It's possible to make a movie about the same remakes or another one. You know, I'd, uh, it's possible for remakes to be good too, based off the same subject material. It's just the the subject material here is not the problem. It's just the meandering of the story and the lack of focus and direction. And even when there is cool things presented in the plot and characters, those things not being really acted upon, no pun intended. So how did you feel about the 
the way it's shot, actually. Because I, I know you were kind of taking pot shots at uh at it during Contreras Corner, but uh did you feel like it was just too dark to be effective? No. No. <laughs> okay. I enjoyed that and I enjoyed the the born film or the born camera. Uh the only thing I, I would say every setting looked exactly the same. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was so fucking stupid that the only uh, cur- character wearing color in the movie was that girl wearing red. I guess she <laughs> was Satan or something. Yeah, I thought that was really dumb. But the actual presentation in terms of the style and the, um, I guess, cinematography would be the right word. No, it's just the settings all ran together and that the woman in red. No, because if it if this was filmed in ninety eight or ninety nine, I can't say they stole that from the Matrix. But coming out in two thousand, it probably definitely seemed like they stole it. It it looks good though. I, I I agree with you there. I mainly what I would take away from it is just that it looks good. It looks like a movie that was shot by that was directed by a director of photography. It, if nothing else, that's what makes it a little distinctive. But yeah, that's about it. It's kind of unfair to ask this question, but did Winona Ryder make any sort of impression compared to... Uh, let's say, I mean, you, you had a, a very damning comment uh, before we started recording about Alien Resurrection. So when you compare her performance here, where she's more of a lead compared to you know Alien Resurrection, where she's kind of you know playing second fiddle to, you know, to Sigourney Weaver, I don't know. Does, that, does she make more of an impression here, even though she has less to work with? Um, uh, not really. She's fine in this, just like she's fine in Alien Resurrection. The problems with these respective movies have nothing to do with Monona Ryder. From a primal male aspect, I, I find her more attractive in this movie, but uh, <laughs> that doesn't really weigh you, my judgment. You like her with long hair? Is that what you're saying? Or longer hair? To be fair, it's just that one scene where she's got her hair tied back and she's smoking because that's like the rest of the scene. She just looks understandably so very disheveled and ready to take a, a good 12 hour nap. But yeah, um, I mean, they, they work over time to make her look really haunted in this movie, which works. I mean, I guess thematically to answer your question and to reiterate what I said off air off recording. I, uh, given the, the situation or given the scenario, I would much rather rewatch this than Alien Resurrection. That's how little I thought of that movie. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have, it's it's more of me damning Alien Resurrection than it is praising Lost Souls. But uh, I find the story of this way more easy to swallow. It, boring. It's still boring, but the, <laughs> the premise is way easier to uh, just kind of uh, digest. And again, it's 96 minutes or whatever it is. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's a bad movie, but it doesn't hurt anyone. And it doesn't make me like angry is too strong of emotion to say resurrection got out of me. But um, with this, I was just kind of like, okay, with resurrection, there was about a half hour left in that movie. And I was ready for it to be over the whole time with this. (laughs) I just kind of let it happen and whatnot. Um, I, I think this allows Winona to flex a little bit more. Uh, because her character is so frayed and frazzled and other adjectives that start with F. Um, <laughs> I think well, it she's gives her... Definitely, she's, she's moving the plot forward in a way that she wasn't in Alien Resurrection. Here, I think that between her and, and Ben Chaplin, they, they split the, the protagonist duties very evenly Uh I think like we discussed in the last episode, the Alien Resurrection episode, I think that she's there. She's mostly to be the heart of the movie, but not necessarily to be someone that is very active, that takes a lot of action to move mm-hmm. things forward. Uh, but here she's the one that's making things happen. So that definitely makes more of an impression. So I can see that. I guess aside from Beetlejuice so far, you know, the, the, the very high bar we've set so far with the Summer of Winona, but this is this would rank number two in the four movies that we've done. <laughs> so, so you prefer it to uh, Mr. Deeds? That was gonna be my next question. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I was trying to. I was explaining Mr. Deeds to my dad over the weekend, and I can't remember. I remember saying there was something funny in that movie. And I remember what it is now. I can't. I couldn't remember it when I was talking to him, but I remember what it is now. I remember I really liked that thinner reference they made. Uh, but that's the whole point. I couldn't remember on the spot what I liked about that movie. With this, I can just be like, well, you know, there's a really shaky cam, and there's a part where Renona <laughs> puts a crucifix against John Hurt's head, and it sizzles like a McDonald's griddle. It's great. 
and there's that moment where uh, W. Earl Brown snaps that guy's neck, snaps Casey Jones's neck. It's, it's so violent and just like you said. Eventually, you figure out why that happened and why, like the 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 method to the madness. But in the moment, it's like, what the fuck? He, he just like grabbed him and he's like, Grot! it was um. <laughs> That's fucking a solid snake move. You sneak up behind the guards and you, you press square enough times and it just pops his neck. They don't even make an attempt at making it look believable. I mean, as far as something that would happen in the in in the real world, right? Because no. honestly, all you had to do was show the cops taking the brother away. Yes. And that was it. That's all that needed to happen. And then you'd be like, all right, we are in the real world. <laughs> yeah, man. But again, this movie was... Uh, would be a good way of putting it, a polite way of putting it. It's definitely someone's first movie they made. And obviously, um, the director, I'm already, his name's evading me. Uh, Janice Kaminsky. 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 Obviously, this dude had been hanging around movies for fucking decades prior to this. And he actually won the highest level there was to win for his profession of cinematography. But like we were talking about before we recorded, because you can cook doesn't mean you should open a restaurant type thing. (laughs) <laughs> and I think that's the whole point of a great film. Obviously, there are very talented directors uh, that are wise beyond our comprehension. But what makes a great movie a lot of the times is a collaborative effort. And I think that's what a lot of people sometimes forget. And if you take out something like, you know, if it's a fucking bike and you take out one of the spokes on the front wheel and, you know, put it on the back wheel it's going to that that part of it's going to run really well but up front it, there's going to be something lacking in it so this guy has a clear vision for filmmaking but the idea of direction and moving a story along is not necessarily a strong point at least from what i've taken away from lost souls so i don't view this movie as like some abject failure or really bad movie and in the sense of there's nothing redeeming about it at the same time, I, I view it as uh, a lesson that can be learned from people within the film industry that it's a collaborative effort. And just because you're good at one aspect of the game doesn't mean you're going to be able to all encompass it. Uh, I do agree with Curtis in the sense that um, it doesn't really have too much to say about religion and the, you know, the diametric opposition of good and evil. It made me pine for a movie that does a little bit better job of exploring that. Mm -hmm. And you know what movie came to mind? Not Mr. Deeds. Prometheus. I was thinking (laughs) about how up until the, you know, the last 20 minutes of that movie, it does a really good job of examining what do you believe in and how far will you go to keep those beliefs and, you know, what will waver those beliefs for you. And I think this movie just barely, like... You know, it's not even like a piece of uh, zebra striped gum that you chew it for 20 seconds and it loses all flavor. It's not even out of the wrapper. This movie just like (laughs) pulls a stick of gum and shows it to you. And you basically just have to fill in the blanks with the rest of it yourself. (laughs) You know, this movie also could have had a a very powerful father moment between uh, Ben Chaplin and Philip Baker Hall. And it doesn't even go there. (laughs) He should have gone, uncle. (laughs) <laughs> and then it's silent, and Philip Baker Hall just shakes his head no, and he goes, Father? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the only thing left is just the context of this. I, was, I wasn't I was kidding. I watched this movie twice because uh, I think I told you – well, no, I know I told you. I lost power at the house yeah. yesterday. And so that meant I didn't uh, – I couldn't watch the movie on my TV and but i had it downloaded on my phone so i was like all right i'll just i'll watch it on my phone and uh but that i didn't want to watch it on my phone and like take notes so i just watched it i was like i'll watch it and then i'll watch it again and it'll be easier to take notes and you know out of all the movies i could have done that with this one happened but at least it's short but the second time around because i had more time i have to pay attention i was actually just doing a little bit more of uh, reading about where Winona Ryder was when this thing happened and you know i kind of mentioned that she was already starting to go through through you know some personal issues and uh but it's crazy because she has this amazing run of movies through the 90s and and then it's just basically if i remember correctly it's alien resurrection which which we just talked about and you know we split on it but it's still you know even though you would rather watch this movie than that one it's still more of a movie 
I think. <laughs> and then she did, I want to say it's Girl Interrupted. And then Autumn in New York, which is a romantic drama with Richard Gere. That, from what I remember, is not very good. And then this, and then Mr. Deeds. It's just such a a drop in, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say quality. I'll say pedigree of her projects. After you see all the directors she was working with throughout the 90s and the kind of stories that were being told and the kind of character she was being asked to play. And then to suddenly have, you know, Autumn in New York, this movie, and, uh, and Mr. Deeds. You know, it's, I'm not going to say crazy, but it's kind of, it's, it stands out when you're looking at her filmography. And then, you know, she has like a, a lull where she's just basically away from movies and then she comes back and starts making smaller projects. But it's, uh, this is in a way, especially since it was shelved, I think this is something that, I don't know that it explains why she would go and make Mr. Deeds, but it gives it a little bit more context. Because, you know, when we're watching Mr. Deeds, I remember, you know, we understand why Adam Sandler would have her there, but didn't really understand why Winona Ryder would be in that movie. And kind of having seen what she was coming off from, it it makes it a little more uh, understandable. (laughs) She definitely has one of the more interesting, and this is something that we'll definitely, uh, I think, cover more with the Winonis. So I don't want to get too deep into the psychology of it and whatnot, but um, an interesting career in the sense of, she has had trials and tribulations, grown up in the industry type thing, but has kind of never become uh, – what's the phrase I'm looking for here? She's never really crossed that line into being a spectacle, like you know a Lindsay Lohan or something like that. But that being said, the project she chooses definitely, like what you were just saying, uh, is indicative of the time period of her career, where she was at, that type of thing. I think it'll be interesting to reflect upon that and keeping this particular uh, time frame in mind when we get to it. Like I said, I, I've kind of envisioned that's going to be, uh, our, as Jerry Springer would say, our final thought when we do our, our <laughs> retrospective on her. So um, I will save that for a later time and date TBD. So let's bring it home here on Lost Souls. And I'm going to go first on this one and just say this. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to label this movie a failure, but I will say it is a D, not a D plus, not a D minus. It's a D right smack dab in the middle. Uh, because it is well below average. There are some things to take away from it that are positive, but those things are all very uh, uh, items of vanity and very skin-deep elements. Julio, is this going into the negative stars? Are we doing a half a star? What are we doing here? <laughs> uh, it certainly sounds like I would go that that far, because, yeah, I've been pretty negative on it. But I will reiterate, I like how it looks. I I like... When our writer Ben Chaplin's performances, as, you know, I think they do as much as they can, and and they have fleeting moments where I really, really like their interactions. Uh, and even though I did most of the heavy lifting, I believe I I like the ending. Uh, everything else is a mess, though. So one and a half stars out of five. One and a half. That was a, that was a bit more generous than I was expecting. So really, I I mean, I I think that. Do you if, ever? I guess. I guess my question is, do you ever go no stars mm. or is a half star as low as you typically go? I'm trying to think. I know uh, I probably gave, well, no, here's the thing. When I rate them on letterbox, it, half a star is the lowest you can go. Okay. So, and I know I gave a uh, gaudy half a star, but if I could have given it zero stars, I would have. <laughs> so, so there's that for a recent, fairly recent uh, example. Uh, this, I mean, you know what? It it takes talent to to create an atmosphere, which is mm-hmm. what this movie does. It does nothing with it, but still, to shoot a movie a certain way and pace it a certain way, I mean, that alone, that, that requires a lot of elements to come together, and I think that that part is done successfully. And now, as far as the, the script, the script is a mess, and I don't think that the that there's anything that Kaminsky could have done other than grab another writer and have him do a, a completely different draft on it, you know? And same thing for the actors. I mean, there's only so much they can do with it. So yeah, one and a half. Fair enough. Speaking of Travolta, you just brought up Gotti. My sister earlier today, we were watching Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Have you ever watched that show? Uh, yeah, Kelly's a big fan. I've I've been watching it uh, through her. You know, she'll be playing it and I'll have it on the background. Oh, that's fucking great. Um, but they were just talking about 
Andy Samberg's character was talking about Nicolas Cage movies and brought up Face Off. And Lillian's like, is that any good? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what yes, kind of fantastic. question <laughs> I already I already got during this quarantine she'll ask me for movie recommendations and she'll take them usually one tenth of the time but I did get her to watch uh, Leave in Las Vegas and she was a big fan of that I mean as big of a you know what I mean it, it's not <laughs> yeah, like you can I was actively enjoy that movie but she really appreciated the acting in it and which it is it's good was she asking for a specific movie that would make her despair about life and you threw that one in or, or was it just you No, i can't remember if i told you this or if we talked about it but like when she started it she thought when i recommended it to her oh yeah she thought it was <laughs> vegas vacation not vegas vacation uh honeymoon in vegas so she's like when yes. does james con come on and i was like uh <laughs> You should probably just keep watching the movie. But speaking of recommendations and plugs, moving into our closing, and as we always do, we have some plugs to go over, uh, or typically we we always certainly have our perennial plugs, which are the festive years who provide our opening and closing tracks, uh, and for the Summer Winona, one of our supplemental tracks to play over when uh, we have a guest on here. Um, our opening is Last Stand, Closing, Summer of 99, Julio, what's the title of our supplemental track for the Summer Winona? Uh, all right, so the the music behind the clips is the intro to Don't Look Now. Uh, also, we've been playing with different tracks at the end. And Alex, you, I was gonna text you about this, and I was like, ah, eh, you know, I'll just tell him what we're <laughs> what we're recording. I messed up last uh, last episode. I was in such a rush to get the Alien uh, Resurrection episode out that I forgot to put a closing track. I caught it. Uh, about a day later when I was listening to the episode by myself and uh, and it just basically the episode ended after your your sign off and I was like fuck I didn't put the music at the end so then I fixed it and now uh, you know it's there but basically anybody that downloaded the the episode before then uh, during our first day of having it put it out is uh, didn't get to listen to that song so I'm putting it again on at the end of this episode uh, it'll be pretty funny because the track is called Not That Cool and I think it's pretty like up tempo and contrasting it with this episode being about lost souls is going to be uh, pretty funny. Excellent. And yeah, I didn't catch that. I listened to the episode several days after the fact, so you're good with me. You don't have any, <laughs> uh, yeah. but that's the festive years, the festive years.com for all your festive years needs. Uh, yes. Our logo was made by Hans Ruth Gieser. He is a Renaissance man. Basically he uh, has books, novels that he writes. Uh, he has podcasts. He does logos. He's an artist. So you can find all his stuff at mildemonios.pe. Uh, you can also contact him at mildemonios at hotmail.com. That's M-I-L-D-E-M-O-N-I-O-S. Uh, you can also contact him on Twitter at mildemonios. Uh, he has a lot of stuff going on. His podcasts, he, as if it wasn't enough that he has basically a podcast about just basically Peruvian current events, uh, which is in Spanish called Nación Combi. That's in every podcatcher. And then he has a podcast in English uh, about immigrants to Peru. That's on iVox. It's called Living in Peru. And he was telling me he has another podcast now on RPP, which is one of the main networks in Peru. I'm going to put the link on, uh, on our show notes. Excellent. As I just mentioned, uh, we're recording this on May 27th. Uh, this is coming out on what, June 1st? Yes. Okay, so we will have already uh, participated in the live stream for The Cure, so we want to uh, a preliminary retroactive thank you, I think is what we <laughs> Yes, call to all it, of you to... that listen to us uh, in the future for us, but in the past for you as you listen to this. I am sure it went swimmingly. Uh, but as it stands right now, uh, we we haven't even rewatched. Well, in my case, rewatch. In case of Alex, watch for the first time, uh, Sliver yet. So that's in our future. It's very exciting. Yes, but want to say thank you to uh, the live stream for the cure, and thank you to everyone that uh, participated and uh, contributed. Um, Oh, we'll and... have, a, I guess, we're supposed to have a raffle, which, of course, we can't do right now because it hasn't happened yet. But by next episode, by episode 110, which will be dropping on 610, that's when we'll we'll do the raffle and announce the winner. Excellent. 
you cut me off and ruined my segue, so I'm going to have to go again. Thank you for every <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for everyone that participated and contributed. And speaking of contributing, uh, our social media guru, uh, Zoe Perez, we want to, um, as we have worked in regular to this uh, segment here, just giving her a shout out for all the work she does on our social media, specifically our Instagram page. Very much appreciated. She does a, a very good job, better than Julia and I could do, and I think really helps drive engagement. Uh, she definitely does. She definitely does. Now, perennial plugs out of the way. Alex, do you have something to plug at the end of this episode? Uh, I've just been, as is no secret for people that have been listening since this started, been playing a lot of video games. The PlayStation Network had this game, which I had read a lot about in the past few years called hotline Miami. It was on sale for like two bucks and I have been playing a lot of that. It is ridiculously difficult, but it is so challenging and addictive is the word I was looking for there. Um, It's presented like an eight bit game. So it really harkens back to the days of our childhood. Remember like just the, endorphins rush you would get as a little kid when you beat a really hard level on Mario or Sonic or something like that. <laughs> so, uh, cause that's one thing that kids today don't understand. Video games are awesome and look incredible now, but they're so easy compared to what was designed for myself and Julio when we were children. So, uh, Hotline Miami, I believe because of all this that's going on, uh, PlayStation network has been getting a lot of money from me because so much is so cheap on there right now. I think they call it like the spring sale, but it's basically the, you the know, Corona spring sale. sale parentheses. We know you guys are all at home right now, so we're going to make games really cheap. Um, so that and then uh, rewatched it the other day because my dad said he'd never seen it and I was angry about it uh, was uh, The Goods. <laughs> I I honestly think that would be in my top five comedies of all time. Oh, my like, God. Have you seen it? I I've seen most of it. I think I missed the last 20 minutes or so. Uh, it, 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 is, it will be an episode, right? Because it's it's low enough on Rotten Tomatoes. I believe so. It's in that... Yeah, it's 27%. It's, it's in that rarefied air of like Wayne's World 2 for me of like every... Like there's not a period of time longer than three minutes where something's not really, really funny. And it's... Um, I'm not saying that it would work for everybody because obviously it didn't. But for me, for my style of comedy and what I interpret as funny, that movie is right up there with any comedy I've seen as far as just like constant nonstop hilarity. I couldn't think of anything more intelligent to say than that. And also, I'll save it for the episode, but it plays it it has a very special place in my heart in reference to the contrarians also with uh, respects to an original approach we took to it. I will save that for the episode that we inevitably do on it. Cause I don't want to give it away here, but uh, <laughs> the goods, even before the contrarians was first conceived uh, played into something that would eventually become of our podcast. So uh, yeah, if you're a, a moron like my dad and in the past <laughs> 11 years on this planet, haven't seen the goods, watch the goods. It's amazing. And if you're looking for something to do to pass the time and you own a PlayStation play hotline, Miami. It's been a while since we've uh, talked about Jeremy Piven in a movie, so, you know, we're due. He's main event or nothing with us on The Contrarians. He's the star <laughs> of the movie or nothing, uh, like with Smoke and Aces and I guess to a lesser extent uh, Entourage, but I think, oh, I think it's only- I think everybody f- knows that uh, J- Jeremy Piven is the true heart uh, in Entourage. I think that's fitting that when we eventually do bring the goods into this, but then from that point forward, we can only do- Piven movies where he is the the focus. All right, we, we we should dig hard on that, especially for the fresh ones. I was about to say, I think we've run out of material after we've done the goods. <laughs> um, all right, I have two quick plugs, and they're both for podcasts. Uh, one actually has a promo. It's called Your Brain on Facts, and it's a show different from what I usually uh, listen to, and that it's not necessarily about movies. It's just 30 minutes uh, of just interesting facts. And the, the host, uh, Moxie, she's just basically tells you about stuff and she's funny. Generally, it's stuff that uh, I actually didn't know. And it's just very interesting. Sometimes stuff that I'm surprised I didn't know. Sometimes stuff that I just I had no idea was even possible. And the topics are wide ranging. You know, there was one episode that was just entirely about people that had survived horrible scenarios. Uh, 
But then there was another one that was uh, fittingly for our Lost Souls episode that was about uh, religious practices and baptisms. Uh, so it's it's just a lot of fun. Uh, she sent me her promo, so we'll play it right here. Need to satisfy a hungry mind? Every week, Your Brain on Facts brings you science. Why does mint feel cold? History. King Charles II of Spain was so inbred, his family didn't bother educating him. Music. Many hit songs and even entire albums were written for revenge. Technology. The first video game was made on an oscilloscope in 1958. And every other topic under the sun. Look for Your Brain on Facts on your favorite podcast app or at yourbrainonfacts.com. So that was Your Brain on Facts. Check them out. Um, your favorite podcatcher. And my other podcast doesn't have a, a promo she doesn't even have like a Twitter account. She has an Instagram. But uh, my friend Jocelyn, I mentioned her here before because she's uh, one of the funniest, most creative people I know. Uh, and in a few days, I'm going to plug her show also during our live stream for the Cure segment. But uh, she has a podcast called Breast Cancer is Boring. And that title is just basically Jocelyn in a nutshell as far as, you know, somebody who can take something that's like deadly serious and talk about it in a very... Uh, uh, irreverent but informative manner uh long story short she was diagnosed with breast cancer about two years ago and basically has gone through the entire process and now she's in remission but uh one of the things that she was dealing with was kind of trying to find information from people who had gone through it and not being able to find something that was just very straightforward uh she told me, you know, she kept running into uh, just these podcasts or web pages or whatever that were very like inspirational and very, you know, just trying to motivate you to get through it and whatever. And that's great. That has that was, that has its use, obviously. But she also wanted something that would just tell her exactly how it was going to be. And because she couldn't find it, she decided, all right, well, I'm going to do it when I'm done with all the stuff. I'm going to start doing it. So that's basically what her podcast is about. It's just her talking to uh, her co-host about her experience, her exper- their experiences, because her co-host has also gone through it. And uh, it's, uh, if it wasn't Jocelyn doing it, I would have more trouble getting into it. But uh, uh, because she's just so charismatic and she's just so funny and so just lively in the way she approaches the subject matter, it's actually uh, just, you know, fascinating watch. At the same time, also, because she's my friend and I know her, listening to some of the stuff she went through makes it a little harder. So, you know, it hits both ways. But anyway, breast cancer is boring. Obviously, you don't need to uh, have uh, experienced cancer directly uh, to listen to it. But it's it's very interesting. And, you know, in the in the spirit of the live stream for The Cure, I thought it was an appropriate plug. Excellent. As we've tried to do uh, since this whole COVID-19 pandemic has started, is provide y'all with plenty of entertainment, be it video games, movies, podcasts, Books, what have you, things to put your mind at ease and just kind of help provide a momentary distraction. So hope you all find these as useful as the previous ones. Um, We'll continue to try to provide what we can. For now, though, that's going to do it for Lost Souls. Julio, what's next? Up next, maybe the, the main reason why the summer of Winona exists. We are going to tackle reality bites. It's episode 110, so it's a gray area. Uh, Alex, do you have a preference? Are you defending? Are you attacking? Do you want to figure it out later? Let's uh, let's save it for the episode. Okay. Uh, it is uh, a movie I grew up with. If you've listened to us for a while, you know it's a movie I love. It's a movie I first brought up way back in episode 8 when we talked about Empire Records. So... You know, Empire Records is to Alex what Reality Bites is to me. This should be an interesting episode. It is 100% and diluted Winona, in my opinion. It is the Saturday Night Fever to win our writer. You know, Saturday Night Fever is John Travolta's Reality Bites. Reality <laughs> Bites is Winona Ryder's Saturday Night Fever. It's just the extract of Winona Ryder is there. Um, but anyway, I look forward to that. Watch it. Uh, we do have a few clips for the, for both sides of the episode. So uh, yeah, should be pretty exciting. You know, when our writer, Ethan Hawke, Ben Stiller, Janine Garofalo, Steve Zahn, I, I, I could keep going. Can't stop. Won't stop. Nope. That's what's on deck. What you've been listening to was lost souls. Hopefully we didn't lose you with it, <laughs> but <laughs> you or your soul. That uh, we, as always appreciate y'all listening to the contrarians where we're right and you're wrong. And we will catch you next time. It's not- the